G'day everybody and welcome to week 4 of Laws 12063, Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. I'm Anthony Maranek. This week we're going to be looking at grammar. Now you'll notice that I left a little bit of a pause there. I left a little bit of a pause there so that everybody could groan about the fact that this week's lecture is about grammar. But it really is important and I'm hoping by the end of this lecture to convert you to the idea of the importance of this lecture. I'm going to start out with two apologies. If you went to school before 1975, you would have done all of this stuff already. If you went to school or, or um, learned to read before the mid to late 1970s in Australia, possibly even the early 1980s, then you would have spent a lot of time at school being drilled on fundamental grammar over and over and over again. And the purpose of this lecture may well be to do no more than reawaken some dormant memories of long ago school days and long ago school concepts that you've long since drawn in to your uh, general knowledge of the English language. If however you learned to read or went to school any time from the early to mid 1980s onwards, the dominant manner of teaching English while you were learning at school was known as whole language. The concept of whole language was that grammar didn't need to be taught separately as a structured set of rules. Instead, people would pick grammar up as they went along. That the important thing was for people to read and the important thing was for people to use language to communicate meaning. And that as they did so, they would gradually start to learn the rules of grammar almost intuitively. Now, there is actually a lot to be said for the whole language approach to literacy. The idea that literacy is a functional exercise and that what people need to be able to do is read and write effectively without having to stop and think about rules of grammar. The problem is, for our purpose, we all want to be lawyers or at the very least we want to be law school graduates which means that people will expect us to be experts in language. So just having a standard level of literacy is not going to be enough to make you a successful law student or a successful lawyer. Even further than that, quite often disputes in the law come down to fine points of grammar. And so what's going to happen in this lecture, and you'll get much more detail in the uh, lecture notes, is that every point that I make about grammar, I'm going to reinforce by directing you to a real life case, usually in the High Court, where the entire case swung on a point of grammar. Now the truth is that most of the time, in most cases that you do, you're not going to need to reach for your grammar book. But just every now and then, it's really going to matter. And so the question you need to ask yourself is, do I want to be the lawyer who understands the grammar and can use it on behalf of my client? Or do I want to be the lawyer who's hoping that the other lawyer doesn't understand grammar as well? I've got to emphasize that in the space of 40 minutes or so today and in the space of uh, one set of lecture notes, I'm not going to be able to turn you into a, a, a grammar expert. However, I do have a couple of pieces of advice on how you can get there. First is that um, in the, in the uh, course guide for this subject, I've prescribed a really excellent textbook called The Complete Guide to English Usage for Australian Students by a woman named Margaret Ramsey. Now this really is an excellent textbook. It's not too long. It's not written um, in too complex of a way, but it breaks all of these elements of language down and gives you examples and provides many more aspects of grammar than what I've provided for you today. There's another one that um, is a, uh, a one of the stars of my bookshelf, but you can very rarely find it these days. Um, the version that I've got was uh, printed in the early 1980s um, called The Oxford Guide to Writing by Thomas Kane, K-A-N-E. Um, the subtitle is A Rhetoric and Handbook for College Students. Now, 
if you can get your hands on that one, it's just excellent in terms of providing you uh, with further assistance with advanced grammar. So today we're going to get our heads around some of the basics. The only other thing that you can do if you want to go beyond that is have a look at those textbooks or read, read, read. I promise you there will come a day after law school when you no longer have to read textbooks day by day by day. When that day comes, the more reading that you can do of high quality literature, the more expert you will be in the use of language and the better you will be as a lawyer. I've often reflected on the fact that uh, His Honour Justice Callanan, formerly a Justice of the High Court of Australia, is also a novelist. And you read the judgments of someone like His Honour Justice Michael Kirby, who just writes excellently. And you think, here are people who are not only involved with, the, with language as a matter of communicating law, here are people who truly understand and are expert in the use of language. That's where I think we as lawyers should aspire to be. Anyway, enough language philosophy from me. Let's get on with the task. The first question I want to address is the pretty basic question of what is grammar? It's a word that we've all heard, but I'm not sure that too many people really take any time out to think about what grammar actually is. Simply put, Grammar is a set of rules, and it's a set of rules about how we can stitch words together in order to communicate meaning. You see, we know that words have meaning on their own, but we know that words have much more meaning when they're arranged in sentences and when they influence one another. We also know that when we use words, unless we're speaking to ourselves. We're using those words to communicate in the hope that the person on the other end of the communication will decode those words and will get into their head the meaning that we were trying to establish when we made the sentence up in the first place. Grammar provides a common set of rules, a common set of understandings on how we're going to stitch words together in order to give them fully understood meaning so that they can be readily decoded by the person at the other end of the conversation. I wonder how many of you have family or friends from a non-English speaking background. My grandmother came to Australia from Germany not long after the Second World War. And even though she's been in Australia now for the better part of 60 years, in fact for more than 60 years, she still sometimes speaks English using German grammar. So she'll sometimes put her words out of order. The same, she'll use the same English words that you or I might use, but she'll stitch them up in another way. So she might say, this morning I am to the shops going. Because that would be correct grammar in German, but it's incorrect grammar in English. You can see that all the words are right, but because she's using a different grammar, they're stitched together in a way that sounds unusual and a little uncomfortable for us. So that's what grammar is. It's a set of rules that tells us how we can arrange words to communicate meaning in a way that's going to be readily decoded by the person that we're trying to communicate with. Sometimes grammar can give the same words a different meaning. I am going home four simple words, can be rearranged, am I going home? You can see that just by moving one word, we've changed the meaning of the sentence from being a statement to being a question. We've changed the position of the speaker from being a person who knows what they're going to do and is simply informing us of the task, to someone who's not sure what's going on and is asking for more information. So you can see grammar changes the meaning of words. Grammar changes the meaning of sentences. Given that the law is made of words, grammar has a massive, powerful capability to change the meaning of law. That's why we need to understand it. We're going to start with some real basics. 
this stuff when I went through school was uh, was taught almost at a primary school level but it's surprising how many people don't understand it and it's surprising to me when I've talked to students in the past and I've been trying to use these concepts in discussion of statutory interpretation that I've met blank looks so forgive me if I'm teaching you to suck eggs but I think we might start with the start each sentence that you'll ever read has four identifiable elements. Now I've put a sentence on the slide there. The sentence says the respondent will transfer $1,000 before the close of business on the day of settlement. The first element that we look at in a sentence is the verb. Every sentence has a verb. The verb tells us what's happening. If the verb changes, the entire sentence changes. If the verb changed from the respondent will transfer $1,000 to the respondent will receive $1,000, we have a very different respondent. If it says the respondent will steal, will earn, will acquire, will spend $1,000, we have a bunch of different meanings. So the verb fundamentally tells us what's going on. Now most verbs have to be done by someone. If there's running going on, someone must be running. If there's transferring of $1,000 going on, someone's got to be transferring it. That person is referred to as the subject. So the subject is the person thing or concept which is doing the verb. Now quite often, but not always, the verb is being done to something. The respondent will transfer. Leads us to the question, the respondent will transfer what? The respondent will transfer their staff, will transfer their possessions, will transfer their affections, will transfer a thousand dollars, what is the respondent transferring? Whatever the verb is being done to is known as the object. The rest of the sentence is known as the predicate. The predicate gives us context for, what's for what the subject is doing to the object. Now, why is this important in a legal context? Well, let's look again at that sentence that I've put at the top of the, uh, of the slide. The respondent will transfer $1,000 before close of business on the day of settlement. The verb tells us what the legal obligation is. What is the respondent legally obliged to do? They were obliged to transfer. The subject tells us who that obligation is upon. The respondent will transfer. The object tells us who that legal obligation is in favour of or in respect to. The respondent will transfer $1,000. Sorry, the, the object tells us what the legal obligation is in respect to. So the respondent will transfer $1,000. You can see that that basic fundamental sentence structure tells us the most important stuff that we need to know about the legal obligation established by a contract, by a will, by a statute, by just about any sort of legal document. If you're looking at a legal document that creates an obligation or, or creates a right, you should straight away be thinking, where's the key sentence that does so? What's the verb? Because that's going to tell me what the obligation is. What's the subject? Because that's going to tell me who's got the obligation. And what's the object? Because that's going to tell me what it's an obligation to do. You can see how grammar matters in a legal context, not just in a grammar school context. Let's push on now and talk about phrases and clauses. 
Phrases and clauses are groups of words within a sentence that express a distinct meaning that is part of a sentence. We need them because sometimes we don't have, sometimes we want to express a meaning as part of a sentence, but that meaning can't be expressed in one word. We need to express that meaning in a series of words, but that series of words is expressing one concept. Phrases and clauses are slightly different depending on whether they have a verb. We're going to start with phrases. Phrases identify a distinct thought or concept as part of the sentence and they do not create a ver uh, contain a verb. So we have a sentence there that says the applicant contacted the respondent on six occasions between December and January. So let's break the sentence down. We've got a verb, contacted, so we know what happened. The subject is the applicant, because it's the applicant who did the contacting. The object is the respondent. The respondent is the thing that got contacted. So we know who's done what. But then there's more information that the sentence wants to give us. The applicant contacted the respondent on six occasions between December and January. Now, there's no single word that would let us communicate the idea that there were six communications, and there's no single word that would let us communicate the idea that those communications happened between December and January. If we want to communicate that, we have to do it by using a series of words. In this case, the series of words does not contain a verb, so it's a phrase. The important thing is that that phrase is a self-contained little block of meaning within the sentence. So whenever you're looking at a phrase within a sentence, what you're asking yourself when you break the sentence down is what is the block of meaning that this phrase is trying to communicate? Clauses, on the other hand, do contain a verb. They do exactly the same thing as phrases. That is, they express a meaning or a block of meaning, but they do so in a way that does contain a verb. I want to talk about four types of clause. The first type of clause I want to talk about is a principal clause. A principal clause could be a sentence in itself. So it has within it a subject and a verb and potentially an object. Now, if you look in the uh, lecture notes that I've given you at 7.3, you'll see an example sentence which has been taken from a sample contract. It says, the supplier agrees to deliver the car to the purchaser on Thursday the 10th of January and the purchaser agrees to inspect the car immediately upon delivery. Now what you can see is that within that, we've got a clause that says the purchaser agrees to inspect the car. That could stand alone as a sentence. The purchaser agrees to inspect the car. Perfectly good English. But in this case, it's placed within another sentence. It has a verb, agrees to inspect. It has a subject, the purchaser. That's the purchaser, the one who's agreeing to inspect. It has an object. The car. So it has everything that a sentence requires, but in this context it communicates meaning within the sentence. So it's a principal clause. The next sort of clause I want to talk about is a noun clause. A noun clause can't, uh, can't stand alone as a sentence, so it doesn't have a subject, a verb and an object but it does have a verb in it. The important thing about a noun clause is that it does the same thing as a word which is a noun. That is, it identifies for us a person, a thing, or a concept. In the notes, the, sentence, the sample sentence I've given you is, the defendant told the victim to hand over the money. Now what's the noun clause there? The noun clause is to hand over the money. 
to hand over the money is not a sentence on its own. We can't. Well, you couldn't walk up to someone and say to hand over the money. That would make no sense. Let's break the sentence down. We've got a verb, told. So what this sentence is telling us about is a communication. We know who told, the defendant told, so the defendant is the subject. We know who they told, they told the victim. So we have an object, the defendant told the victim. What did they tell the victim? They told the victim something, something. So what is that thing that they told the victim? They told the victim to hand over the money. So you can see the phrase to hand over the money describes a thing, that is, the thing being told to the victim. That makes it a noun clause. The third sort of clause I want to talk about, well actually we'll talk about the third and fourth types of clauses together, and they are adjectival and adverbial clauses. Now, an adjective when applied to a single word, describes the characteristics of that word. An adverb does a similar thing, but it describes a verb. Adjectival and adverbial clauses do exactly the same thing. They just give greater explanation of the characteristics of the verb or of either the subject or the object or some other noun in the sentence. So one of the examples that I've given in the, in the uh, notes is the applicant filed the document which complied with the court's requirements. Which complied with the court's requirements is a clause. It has a verb, complied. It applies to the document which in this case is the object of the sentence, and it tells us something about the document. It tells us that the document was compliant with the court's requirements. So you can see this is an adjectival clause. Its job is to properly describe a person, thing, or concept somewhere else in the sentence. So again, it's a group of words that forms one of the bricks of which the sentence is made. You will find that when you come to interpret statute later on in the course, one of the things that you will do a lot of is breaking sentences down and identifying along the way clauses and phrases, identifying their meaning and identifying how they relate to the subject, verb and object which create and define the legal obligation. Next I want to move on to tenses. And I want to spend a little bit of time with this because it's something that um, unfortunately well and truly has gone by the wayside in terms of teaching of English in this day and age, but it's critically important. Tenses allow us to locate a verb in time and in context. I'll say that again. Tenses allow us to locate a verb in time and in context. Why is this critically important to us as lawyers? Well first and foremost it's critically important because we know that in legal writing the verb is going to describe the legal obligation. We also know just as a matter of practice and a matter of the things that you've learned in the last few years of studying law that it doesn't just matter who has an obligation, it matters when they have that obligation. Someone might not have completed an obligation yet, but if they're not required to have done it yet, they haven't breached that obligation. Sometimes it's just as important to know when an obligation applies as it is to know what the obligation actually is. What this means is that the tense that is applied to a verb will be critically important in understanding the nature and the location in time of the legal obligation. Now when we're talking about verbs we describe them in terms of two um, 
different characteristics. The first one, which I've presented on the slide on the horizontal axis, is very simple, past, present and future. So we have one group of words that allow us to know that the verb has been done in the past. We have another group of words that allow us to know that the verb is going on right now. And we have one group of words that tell us that the verb is going to go on in the future. Now for each of those, there are four types. The first type is simple. The simple form of the verb just explains what action has happened, is happening or is about to happen. The continuous form of the verb tells us that once we've located the specific time to which the verb applies, at that time the verb is ongoing. This will make more sense in a moment. The third type is perfect. What that tells us is that once we've located the verb in time, the verb is actually complete at that time. And then the perfect continuous, which says once we've located the verb in time, we can say that the verb had been going on, but was then complete by that time. Sound like gobbledygook? Let's have a look using the uh, example that's given on the slide there. Now I've taken one simple verb, the verb to type, and I've put it through all 12 of those different tenses. Let's start with the simple. If we're talking about something that's happened in the past, we might say, I typed. Sounds pretty easy. In the present, I type. In the future, I will type. I think pretty much everyone is going to be able to get that concept very quickly. Now let's look at continuous. Continuous says that at the relevant moment, which is, let's say, let's say the relevant moment in each case is one hour apart. So the relevant moment for the present is right now. The relevant moment for the past is one hour ago, and the relevant moment for the future is one hour into the future. If at this moment we are typing, we might say, I am typing. What this means is my fingers are on the keyboard and I'm actually doing it at this moment. I am typing. Now for past continuous, if one hour ago we were sitting at the keyboard, our fingers were going up and down and we were typing, that would be past continuous. We would say, I was typing. If in one hour's time we expect to be sitting at the keyboard with our fingers going up and down, we could say, I will be typing. Because at each of those relevant moments, at the relevant moment one hour ago, the relevant moment right now, or the relevant moment in one hour's time, we will actually be, or we will have been actually doing the action. So the action will, at the relevant time, be continuous. Next, the perfect tense. Perfect tense says that at the relevant time, the verb had been perfected. The verb had been completed. So again, we've got three relevant times. One hour ago, right now, and one hour into the future. In the perfect tense, we're saying, one hour ago, I had been typing, I'd been sitting there with my fingers going up and down, but I'd stopped. I'd completed it. So, one hour ago, I had typed. I wasn't typing one hour ago, but I had been typing before that, do you see? I had typed. Now let's say we're referring to the present. A couple of minutes ago we stopped typing, but we have been typing. What might we say in the present? I have typed. 
in the future. We haven't typed yet, but by the time we get to one hour's time from now, we will have. So I will have typed, but I'll have stopped by then. Finally, we get to the perfect continuous. For perfect continuous, we've stopped, but we're referring to that period of time when we had when the action had been ongoing. So one hour ago, I wasn't typing, but I had been typing. Right now, I'm not typing, but I have been typing. In the future, I won't be typing in one hour's time, but I will have been typing for the whole time between now and then. You can see how each of those 12 tenses locates the same verb in a different time and in a different state of being continuous or complete. Why does this matter? Well, let's have a look at some case law. In the notes I've given you the case of Sykes and Cleary. Sykes and Cleary was a, uh, a famous case that surrounded the election of Phil Cleary to the House of Representatives. So for those of you who are in Victoria, you will know that Phil Cleary was um, a footballing identity for many years. Um, and he was actually pre-selected by the Australian Labor Party to fill um, Bob Hawke's seat when, uh, when Bob Hawke res uh, resigned after uh, losing the leadership to Paul Keating in around 1991 or 1992. Now, um, Cleary was challenged, his, his election was challenged on the basis that at the time that he was elected, he was constitutionally unable to be elected to the parliament. When the, the High Court came to look at whether or not at the time that he'd been elected, he'd been incapable of being elected, they had to work out when was the exact time that he had to satisfy those requirements for candidacy. Justice Dean wrote the quote that's in the, in the notes there. He said, the verbs of the section of the Constitution are all in the present tense. There's only one verb which is in the future tense, shall be incapable. And what Justice Dean took from that is that the requirements imposed by the Constitution were not requirements to be satisfied while the person was a candidate. Rather, they were requirements that were to be imposed when the person was actually serving as a senator or a member of the House of Representatives. So it was located in a time that was in the future with regards to the election. Can you see how in this case the tense of a verb and therefore the location in time of the obligation made a massive difference in this case to the composition of our House of Representatives. Let's look at another example, perhaps a simpler one from contract law. Let's say we've got two obligations. The first obligation says the contractor will pour the concrete on the 1st of May. Now that's a future simple tense. The contractor will pour. Now let's say the same sentence had been written in the future perfect tense. The contractor will have poured the concrete on the 1st of May. Can you see that there's a difference between those two obligations? They're both expressed to be in the future tense. But one of them is saying on the 1st of May you have to be there pouring concrete. The second one is saying you have to pour the concrete by the 1st of May. You will have poured the concrete on the 1st of May. I don't care if you do it on the 1st of April, but you will have poured it on the 1st of May. You can see that it changes the nature of the obligation. 
getting familiar with the 12 tenses, being able to identify them and identify their effect and identify their impact on legal obligations is incredibly important for you as a lawyer. Let's move on now and talk briefly about pronouns. Pronouns are words that stand in for a noun. And they're pretty darn important because if we kept using um, the full verb, uh, sorry, the full noun, every time we want to refer to something, our sentences would become impossibly unwieldy. What you've seen in the, the notes is that I've tried to write a sentence using um, no pronouns, and it sounds quite ridiculous. I'll read it out. Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones's tennis player Edward had completed the tennis match played by Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones's tennis partner Edward. Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones's tennis partner Edward were returning to the clubhouse when Mr. Jones and Mr. Jones's tennis partner Edward heard smashing glass and the sound of an alarm. Edward ran to get Edward's mobile phone and call the police while Mr. Jones approached the clubhouse holding Mr. Jones's tennis racket ready to use as a weapon. Do you see how there's no pronouns in there? And the result is a terrible sentence. Now let's do the same thing using pronouns. Mr Jones and his tennis partner Edward had completed their match. They were returning to the clubhouse when they heard smashing glass and the sound of an alarm. Edward ran to get his mobile phone and call the police while Mr Jones approached the clubhouse holding his tennis racket ready to use as a weapon. You can see how by replacing words like Mr Jones and Mr Jones's tennis partner Edward with words like they we've made the sentence make a lot more sense. So pronouns can be incredibly useful and helpful. The problem is, of course, that pronouns can only be helpful if we know exactly who the pronoun stands for. If the pronoun stands for, if it's clear that who the pronoun stands for, then the pronoun will make the sentence much more efficient and much easier to read. But what happens if there's a couple of nouns in the sentence? What happens, for instance, if we're not sure whether the pronoun refers to the subject or the object of the sentence? It might make it impossible for us to tell to whom a particular legal obligation attaches. I've given an example in the notes that says, we've got a, a provision that says, the contractor planted azaleas in the plaintiff's, plaintiff's garden. He considered the soil conditions would suit azaleas best. Who are we talking about? Who considered that the soil conditions would suit azaleas best? The contractor? The plaintiff? It's not clear. Ambiguous pronouns lead to ambiguous sentences and real legal problems. So pronouns can be used they're a fantastic device to use in your writing, but you must be absolutely clear who the pronoun refers to. The case law example that I've given is Pico Holdings in Wave Vistas. Now, in this case, we had a fellow who um, operated a number of companies, and when he was in meetings, even when he was referring to the companies, he was in the habit of referring to the companies by using the pronoun I. So when he said, I think I can do that. What he actually meant was, I think that my company is capable of doing that. Most of the time it wasn't a problem. But then, on one particular occasion, when he used the pronoun I, he says that he meant I personally, not I as the representative of a company. So you can see it wasn't clear who the pronoun referred to. And as a result, instead of doing business with a company, his business partners found themselves doing business potentially with the individual. Pronouns can be incredibly important in that legal perspective. Finally, I want to talk briefly about conjunctions. Conjunctions are like logical operators. I'm sure that all of you have done Boolean searches when you've been using um, databases for your assignments and so on. Um, if you haven't, then you should jolly well run out and learn how to do Boolean searches because they're awesome. Boolean searches involve words like and, or, not, that allow us to put two different concepts into the search engine and define the relationship between them. Conjunctions do exactly the same thing in a sentence. 
they allow us to join two concepts in the same sentence and then they define the relationship between them. Getting the conjunction right is incredibly important because if you change the conjunction you potentially change the logical relationship between the sentence components and that will absolutely change the meaning of the sentence. Let's look at some examples. And for those of you who are already the full bottle on grammar, I know that strictly speaking some of these are prepositions, but I'm sure you'll forgive me for the moment. I'm going to read the same sentence out from the notes seven or eight times. And all I'm going to do in each case is change one word, the conjunction. The applicant pays the application fee and they attend the hearing. The applicant pays the application fee or they attend the hearing. The applicant pays the application fee if they attend the hearing. The applicant pays the application fee when they attend the hearing. They pay the application fee unless they attend the hearing, before they attend the hearing, where they attend the hearing, even if they attend the hearing. Do you see how those logical operators completely change the nature of the applicant's obligation to pay that application fee? using the correct conjunction or looking for the conjunction if you are breaking down a sentence is incredibly important because the conjunction in any sentence where there is a conjunction the conjunction will be the logical hinge on which the rest of the sentence hangs now this week instead of setting a drafting exercise you've got two separate tutorial exercises and they are really important even for those of you who are already well acquainted with grammar, I'd really like you to have a go at these anyway. The first one asks you to analyse a high court judgment. Pick a high court judgment, any high court judgment, any one you like, I don't mind. And go through and play bingo. Find a sentence in active voice, in passive voice, sentences in at least six different tenses, a complex sentence with different clauses and phrases in it, different use of pronouns, different use of conjunctions. It's important for you to start being able to spot these things as you read legal writing. The second thing I'm going to ask you to do is analyse a statutory provision. Now I've given a statutory provision there from the Factors Act 1892 in Queensland and asked a series of questions. This second exercise is going to take much less time but it's just as important to show that when people write statute and when we interpret statute, grammar provides the fundamental rules for us to do so. We can't tell the plain meaning of a statute unless we understand the rules that are used to establish that plain meaning. Look, I really hope that this lecture has been some use to you, particularly those of you who have a, a general understanding of grammar because you've learned the whole English, the whole language way. But I hope it's shown um, many of you that grammar is not just a set of rules that should be studied by English students. Instead, it's a set of rules that should be studied by law students because it teaches us very specifically how we put language together in the law, how the law communicates meaning and obligation, and how we as lawyers can interpret the law in an effective and professional way for our clients and for the court. Next week, we're going to go down one step further and we're going to look at professional language. So we're going to look at the actual words which grammar strings together to form meanings. I look forward to talking to you then.